The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Okay, and now we're back, and uh, joining us is uh, Lynn Buchanan. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for joining us, and I uh, appreciate you being here. Well, thank you for considering me for your program. Oh, yeah, it's uh, an incredible amount to uh, consider there. You're fantastic. Um, now, let's let's start with um, some of your history before we get into the meat of it. Um, so um, uh, tell us a little bit about you. Okay, uh, I was in the military, and uh, um, I was doing programming over in Germany for um, the... Uh, uh, listening post that we had, uh, listening to Russia and East Germany and all that. And uh, I was asked to do a special program that was uh, going to tie together the computers and the listening posts of 12 different countries. Uh, this other sergeant wanted to do the job, but I got, I got it awarded to me. And uh, so anyway... Uh, Right as I was to present the thing, after it was done, all the generals and all that from four, from 12 different countries came in. He had jimmied the computer program while I was out, and when it crashed, uh, when I started to show it, it crashed, and he pointed and said, gotcha. Oh. And um, I have, since I was around 12 years old, I've always had problems with uh, if I get mad things happen around me <laughs> things break and so forth and uh, I got flaming mad and uh, all of a sudden the entire field station just went kablooey wow. um, we'll try not to get you mad <laughs> yeah, I, I try to stay happy all the time uh, but um, the uh, one of the officers there knew what a PK event was, psychokinetic event, and knew that um, uh, all of the electronic equipment, especially the very sensitive stuff that they have, is subject to that. And he reported me. Uh, so uh, a couple of months later, the commander of the uh, U.S. Intelligence and Security Command came out there to uh, install a new base commander where we were. And uh, and he called me into his office and he said, did you kill my computers with your mind? And I thought, what a crazy question. I knew the answer was yes, but I could see myself paying for computers, you know, my grandkids paying for computers. And so... I was going to lie about it, and I kind of heard myself say, yes, sir, I did. And he said, far effing out if I ever got a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> he took me back to D.C. to start a unit where we would destroy enemy computers with the hopes that we could learn to control the information in them so we could, you know, send their missiles into the ocean and things like that. And... Uh, they wouldn't, uh, Congress wouldn't fund it. And so he took me out to a remote viewing unit that was out at Fort Meade and put me in there. And I just took to it like a duck to water. It was the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. And uh, so that's where I stayed the rest of my military career. Wow. So, so uh, this was um, very secret, right? This is like a secret military. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, very much so. In fact, uh, it was even kept secret from the military and from the uh, uh, government customers who used it. Uh, they would ask for intelligence information, and uh, we would turn in information reports on, you know, as sort of eyewitness reports or things like that, or. Uh, open source information reports and when people got to know and associate our name with uh, with what we were doing 
our project would end, it would be scrapped completely, and the next day we'd go back under the name of a new project and just continue working. Um, so, yeah, we were kept even secret from the government. Oh, so so do you think, well, Congress or Senate or even the, the president wouldn't know, or do you think they did? Oh, yeah, they knew. Um, and uh, those, who, those who needed to know knew. Uh, those who didn't need to know, uh, that's why we, you know, kept changing names and all that. Uh, yeah, but the president was always briefed on us. Uh, when the uh, helicopter crashed in Iraq, uh, our information that it crashed got to the president 10 minutes before the electronic notice came through and went up the chain of command. So. The, we turned the uh, information in first before even the, uh, you know, they could report it over the radio. Wow. How, so how does that affect you as in your day-to-day -day living, as in uh, family and uh, friends and that? Did, did they know at the time? Did you keep it secret? Oh, yeah. I couldn't tell my family or anything, you know. Uh, uh, and my my church group they would say you know what do you do and i'd say oh i i program computers uh because that was largely a part of my mos uh method of service uh, i was a russian linguist computer uh scientist uh was my uh method of service on paper so, so nobody else really knew, except for, I guess, people that were involved. That's right, yeah. And our, our most dedicated customers who, who uh, knew what we could do, uh, you know, they were kept apprised of it. But any time the word got around, then all of a sudden our project would be scrapped. It was over, you know. Nobody's doing that kind of stuff anymore, and... Like I say, we'd go to work the next day with a brand new cover name. Yeah. So, where where did it go from there? Like after you, uh, did did the service just end, and did you just retire from it? Uh, I retired from it about two years before this last time when they scrapped the whole project. Um, people ask me if you know if. Uh, they still have another project going like that under another name, and I really don't know. I hope so. Um, I think they would be stupid not to, but of course that raises the question as to whether our government ever does anything stupid or not. <laughs> <laughs> Can't answer that one, eh? <laughs> I'm afraid I already know the answer to that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's ongoing. <laughs> so do you think they actually then stopped it? Why would they scrap it, bud? Is it just to cover? Uh, well, no, there was a actually a good reason to really honestly scrap it, and that was at the end of the Cold War, uh, funding was just being cut severely right and left, especially on uh, intelligence services, and uh, many of the uh, old... Uh, more experienced ground spies, ground agents, and, and all that just had no funding, no jobs. And so if the, um, you know, if the funding question was to dump those crazy psychics out at Fort Meade or keep a good 007 spy, you know, uh, then... Shoot, I'd dump the psychics out at Fort Meade too. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so how do you um, how do you go about doing this? I guess it's it's pretty hard to explain in a just an interview, but uh, well, yeah, you can't do this in a soundbite. Uh, basically, uh, this um, this whole process is not in and of itself psychic has basically nothing to do with, with being psychic. Uh, everyone does tend to have some psychic ability, but the trouble is that uh, it only happens, you know, when 
your daughter's in an accident and all of a sudden you know it and, and you, you know, or someone dies and things. So it's only uh, available to most people during crises and for those people who have an easy time with the psychic ability, uh, they tend to be one at its control rather than controlling it. And um, two, they tend to be, I don't know, how's a nice way to say this? <laughs> uh, let me just let me just end that right there. No, uh, I, I, I think I understand what you're trying to say. Yeah, um, it, but it, the military it, doesn't work that way. Yeah, The military wants everything uniform and it wants everything sensible and uh, plain, easy for anybody to understand and so on. So um, there was a guy named uh, Ingo Swan in New York who uh, devised a way to use the body. Uh, he was looking at martial arts. He devised a way to use the body to act as a translator between the conscious and the subconscious minds. Well, it's your subconscious level that does anything psychic, not your conscious level. And he found that um, when you can set up a line of communications, like in an interview and report, okay, mm. you can interview your subconscious, ask it questions, find out what it knows, and then report the answer. And so the, uh, the remote viewing that he invented was actually nothing more than a... Uh, interview and report process using the body as, you know, in a martial arts way, as sort of a connector between the conscious and subconscious. Uh, the remote viewing itself is only access to your, sub, to your subconscious, which knows things. Um, it's not in and of itself psychic at all. Right. So how how is it that you explain that the subconscious knows things? Is there, or are the subconsciouses connected somehow? Or well, you know, everybody has their own explanation and their own belief system and all that. Right. The fact that I found is that nobody knows. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, they come up with all these fancy explanations. That some of them deal with spirit guides. Some of them deal with. Uh, holograms in the universe and some deal with, you know, alien beings from the planet Scooby-Doo <laughs> or whatever. Nobody knows. <laughs> uh, it seems to just be part of our being. Yeah. Oh, totally. I agree. I, I interview a lot of people in the business and uh, there's some people that have all the answers and that, that's the ones yeah. I don't trust as much. Yeah. <laughs> you <So>. know. <laughs> <laughs> when they give me all these answers about how you're supposed to do things, it's almost become superstition. Uh, or religion. Or religion, yeah. yeah. And that's what it is. I mean, in a way, it's a replacement or yeah. an enhancement of someone's religion. So, uh, Yeah, and that's one of the things I liked about the military method was it was a science. You go, you get trained in it, you learn it. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step method that you do. Um you uh, use martial arts methods to uh, uh, train your body to respond to uh, subconscious awareness and, um, you know, in different ways. And you actually train it with, uh, sort of like the wax on, wipe off type stuff, you know. We train for, we train for months and months and months and never quit training. And... Um, as a result, we'd, we'd go to work, we'd do what everybody would call miracles for eight hours a day, and then we'd go home and watch TV, <laughs> watch TV, <laughs> mow the grass, and, and you know. Uh, a job uh, like anything else. Yeah, I like that. In fact, when I got out of service, and uh, well, two years after I got out of service, and they declassified the uh, remote viewing effort, uh people found out that I had been the trainer in the unit and they started contacting me for training and um, everybody was talking about 
well, ETs and uh, uh, all these different authors, um, uh, Zacharias Sitchin and, and and all those, I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, you know, I was I was a soldier who who went to work every day, and uh, I was a soldier who went to work. Uh, try this just a minute. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I was a soldier who uh, went to work every day and uh, did a job and went home. Uh, I, I never even looked at any of that stuff or, or even knew who Zachariah Sitchin was. Uh, so it was it was totally foreign to me. And all of a sudden, here were all of these people. I was getting like. 80 requests for training a day and uh, some of the people that would call and talk to me on the phone uh, I, I kind of started getting paranoid about you know some of these people are on the street and walking through Walmart with me <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of scary at times <laughs> I, I find that anyway when I walk through Walmart <laughs> yeah <laughs> So, now, the Russians were doing this as well, weren't they? Yes, in fact, they were doing it first. Uh, that's uh, that's why we started doing it. Uh, a man named uh, Pankowski, uh, who had evidently been involved in some of this, tried to defect, and uh, he got some of the uh, uh, Russian paperwork and documentation over to the U.S., and... Of course, everybody had a good laugh about that. Oh, Russians are using psychics, you know, and then they started actually reading and found out, <laughs> yeah, but they're getting our secrets. And uh, so they thought, well, if it, if the Russians are using it and it works for them, maybe we better at least look into it. And uh, so they started searching around for psychics. And... Uh, and giving them, you know, targeting them with top secret information and uh, not letting them know that, you know, what it was. And one guy named uh, Joe McMonagall uh, not only perfectly described the M1A1 Abrams tank, but actually drew pictures of the interior of it and, uh, and highly accurate pictures and didn't even know what he was working on. And uh, so with with Joe's uh, session on that, they thought, maybe there's something to this. Maybe we ought to at least start a, a pilot project and find out. And so they did, and it wound up being a uh, military unit in the military. Yeah, that's amazing. So now in the process, you're not actually... Um like I should start a lot of people um, that talk about remote viewing talk about it in the sense of uh, more the psychic like they leave their body and they go somewhere else and they watch people yeah now and, uh, that's not the way it is with you is it no um, when it when the information came out that the military had been using remote viewers um, the, you know, of course, it hit the newspapers with, you know, psychic spies and all this, but uh, nobody told what it was. And um, and there were actually reporters going around D.C. looking for big palm signs on lawns for, you know, Madame Minerva, the palm reader, yeah. <laughs> and asking her what remote viewing was. And uh, uh, so anyway, the information that came out was bogus, and all of a sudden, the message that got through to everybody on the internet was, oh, this has been scientifically proven that psychic works. And so all of a sudden we had uh, crystal ball remote viewers and palm remote viewers and tea leaf remote viewers and, you know, uh, people who had no idea about the science of controlled remote viewing and uh, just started calling themselves remote viewers. And so even at present, 
I would say close to 90% of everything you find on the internet about remote viewing is just totally bogus, has nothing to do with remote viewing at all. Yeah, I sort of look at it, uh, I, I, I hate to say it, but for the most part, most of it's entertainment. Yeah, uh, well... Well, it's you know, what it should be. <laughs> well, it should be, yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of, uh, I think, in fact, most of the people who are calling themselves remote viewers are doing so honestly. They're not trying to cheat people. Uh, they they really think that remote viewing is psychic. When it's not, it's it's just a scientific process yeah. so how do you, how do you how do you define yourself differently from that then uh, the uh, uh, thing that Ingus Swan invented uh, he called coordinate remote viewing now um, when that information came out then everybody started calling themselves coordinate crystal ball remote viewers and you know <laughs> And uh, so Ingo said, okay, what is one thing that nobody wants to, nobody in this field wants to be called? So he called it controlled remote viewing. And that's what we use. Uh, and the fact is that most people think, oh, the remote viewer is controlled by all these uh, protocols and all. When actually, what it actually means is that the remote viewing is controlled by the viewer and so uh, so the people who are you know into crystal balls and uh, and going into trances and all that they don't want to be controlled so they shy away from that name <laughs> <Yeah>. so now <laughs> is, is this is this something that's developed more since you've been in it uh, in the science side is it something that people can control other people's minds or start to do things? Um, there, okay, that's two questions. Yeah. There. <laughs> yes, it has developed. Uh, once it came out of the laboratory because it was um, uh, tested very thoroughly at Stanford Research Institute before it was actually given to the military and once it was put into operations in the military then it really grew, and now that it's become over into the civilian arena with civilian applications, we're learning how to do other things that were not required by the military, you know. Um, so yes, it has developed. Uh, as far as um, as far as getting into other people's minds and all that, uh, yes you can do that. Uh, with training, you can do it uh, clearly and accurately. Without training, you, you, you can't. Uh, it's advanced stuff, and um, what a lot of people think of as uh, remote, influent, uh, remote control or uh, remote influencing um, is uh, sort of where you get into someone's mind at the subconscious level and you try to persuade them it would be it would better be called remote persuasion you try to persuade them at the subconscious level to be healthier to cure themselves or to uh, change policies or to you know uh, listen to other reasoning and so forth uh, it is not at all remote control where you just control a person. Um, but yes, it's, it is possible, sure. Uh -huh. yeah. Do you sort of put this, is it, is it some way connected to uh, hypnosis? Uh, the remote persuasion, I think, really is. Uh, now, the Russians have developed um, what they call hypnosis at a distance, where they really, really go into this, and uh, and they've had quite a bit of success at it. In the military unit, we were absolutely forbidden to do what was called any 
active mental work, and that is, uh, uh, you know, the remote per- persuasion and all that. But, of course, that was limited to um, U.S. citizens. <laughs> now, if you weren't a U.S. citizen, you were fair game, but, you know, um, uh, a lot of people uh, think, oh, the remote viewers got into my mind and they messed my mind up and all that. Uh, no, we never did any active mental work. Uh, it was all passive. We went and we got intelligence information reported that up the chain of command to the intelligence services, and that was it. Hmm. And so how does this affect you uh, as in your own spiritual side, or did it, did it change? We at Wondery, creators of Dr. Death, Scamfluencers, and Over My Dead Body, go deeper into complex true crime stories to give you an inside look at the facts. And now we're launching the ultimate true crime fan destination, Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Wondery's Exhibit C gives you the detective's lens of all of the evidence, taking you step by step through the twists and turns of each true crime case. Join the Exhibit C online community to access exclusive show merchandise, member-only content, and to hear directly from top criminal and social justice experts, witnesses, and investigators as they take us beyond the evidence and into the case file. Join now by following Wondery Exhibit C on Facebook or find us on the web at WonderyExhibitC.com and listen to true crime podcasts on Wondery and Amazon Music. Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Change any of your beliefs or thoughts? It will. Um, one of the things uh, that you learn first, in fact, one of the milestones we look for in training is when you realize that time is not what you were told in school. Uh, time is totally different. But other than that, what makes a greater impact is uh, the fact that if you can ask your subconscious what's going on halfway around the world and it tells you, it can also tell you why you do those things that you don't want to do, but you wind up doing them anyway, Uh, why you don't do the things you want to do, but you wind up not doing them, and uh, uh, why you're really angry about something or why you're really scared about something. And uh, it can can do in, in one hour what will take a psychiatrist, you know, five years on, on his couch to do. Well, yeah, but he's making a lot of money. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and by doing it this way, you're saving a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't, he doesn't want an instant fix here. He wants to... Yeah. Um, now, I, I've heard you explain this, um, and, I, and, I, and I think it, you did it really well. So I have to uh, ask about the idea of getting into something like uh, figuring out the lottery winning numbers and, and things like that. And uh, for a lot of the listeners, that's going to be a very common question I get. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. So I thought I'd throw uh, it at you. And... Uh, there were uh, actually about 18 different forms of controlled remote viewing that were uh, created out at uh, Stanford Research. One of them was called associative remote viewing, and this works really well. In fact, uh, we did this on a radio program uh, over in Ireland and had 27,000 people participate and correctly predicted the stock market for the next day. Um, What you do is um, numbers and letters and things like that are human constructs. They don't really, they're not real. You know, they're they're not really things, they're constructs. And so they're very hard to view. However, something like your taste, uh, smell, things like that, I mean, this, you are using your body as the go-between. And so um, if you were to say, um, okay, View the number on the first ball and the pick three lottery 
at 7.30 tonight, people would be stuck for it because that's a human construct. But if I were to say to you, uh, at 10 o'clock tonight, tell me what you taste, and um, then I make a list, and I say, if a zero comes up on the ball, I'm going to let you taste vinegar. If a one comes up on the ball, I'm going to let you taste sugar. If a two comes up on the ball, I'm going to let you taste coffee, and and so on through the numbers. Then, knowing that whatever I give you is going to reflect what was on the ball, what number was on the ball, I tell you, move to 10 o'clock tonight and tell me what you taste. Oh, I taste uh, coffee. Oh, I know that a two is, will have been on the ball. And so by doing it that way, I give you something easy to view that is associated with something hard to view. And, uh, and it works very well. Uh, one of my students uh, tried this out and went into it. And uh, he uh, called back in, in uh, a couple of weeks and he said, Hey, I just won the pick three lottery. You know, I got, I think, $200 or something like that. And he called back a couple of weeks later and he said, I did it again, I did it again. And he was all excited. <laughs> After about three times of that, he never called back. <laughs> and um, so I saw him uh, I saw him at a conference several years later and I said, how's that working for you? And he got really kind of nervous and he said, oh, well, I don't do that anymore. And uh, he sort of excused himself very quickly and went and, and uh, got into his Maserati and drove off. <laughs> and... Uh, the, the analogy that we use is if you find a gold ring in your yard, you're going to tell everybody and your neighbors and all. But if you dig a little deeper and find a chest full of gold, you're not telling anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. This goes with, with that. We have people who do the lottery or else go to Vegas and uh, do the roulette wheel. And, uh, and they'll win three or four times and really brag about it and then they just start making money and they don't tell anybody you know yeah yeah they get the system down and, and oh yeah they, yeah and the system works well okay. but the trick is you have to be there at 10 o'clock to give them the taste or else they won't taste anything <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about your now you're you're teaching you're you're running a class now aren't you well, I'm not now. Uh, I have trained over 800, about 850 people, and um, five of those people are trained to the point where they are just excellent trainers. Now, I could have started a thing where they worked for me and all that, but they, uh, they, I didn't want to do that. They went into business for themselves and their teaching, and uh, they're doing an excellent job. And so I figured it was time for me to bow out and uh, pass the baton on. And so any requests that I get for training, I send on to them. Now, I'm starting some online training courses. And uh, I'm having some trouble keeping up the quality because it's not face-to-face -face stuff. So I'm mixing face-to-face -face stuff over the Internet with the online videos and all. And I'm going to be bringing that out this year uh, because I really love teaching this. I really love it. Uh, but right now, no, I'm not teaching. I'm, I'm passing people off to the, uh, to the other people who are teaching and who I trust to teach it correctly. Right. Do you think there's some bad ones out there? There are lots of bad people out there who are not bad people. You know, there are people out there who are teaching what they call remote viewing, and it's excuse the term. It's just crap. <laughs> it really is. Uh, you may have to bleep that one out, but <laughs> uh, but it's just 
it's bogus and they're taking people's money and teaching them this stuff that one doesn't work two isn't remote viewing at all and uh, and there's just you know it's a it's a free country and so there's no way you can stop it but uh, but yeah I would say um, buyer beware hey buyer be very aware there are six people now uh, the five that I have taught to teaching level and uh, Paul Smith in Austin Texas who is one of our remote viewers who is also teaching and so there are six people out there that I would recommend for training and those are the only six uh, everybody else I, I would just tell people to shy away from them yeah do you actually um and when you did it um were you sort of looking at the maybe the motive or the reason why someone would want to be trained well yeah i always ask people that and uh, i would get all kinds of answers uh anything from just curious to uh uh you know i want to bring home missing children and all that uh and so um one of the things we found was that the people who are uh, just curious about it seem to go further with it, except for the people who want it for their business purposes. Now, they're going to use it for the rest of their life and, uh, you know, or for the rest of their business life. But uh, one of the things we found is that every time somebody comes with a new interest and a new reason for taking this, we actually find a new application uh, back in the military this was used for spying only and now then we're we're finding all of these applications that uh, it's extremely useful for and so uh, it's still in the development stages actually hmm. is there any people that you had to reject because of something like a, a reason that they wanted to do it or Oh, uh, yeah, I tend to reject uh, very flaky people. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are people that I wouldn't want in my home, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, one of the things that we found is that good, I mean, really honest, good, natural psychics don't need this. Um, also, there are those who... Uh, who have the one experience and because of religious background or upbringing or whatever immediately think that their soul is doomed for hell and no forgiveness you know uh, and they they go away immediately and don't come back and, um, the other type that um, I really don't want because they can never learn to do this is the type who lives, breathes, eats, everything psychic. Uh, you know, everything is has a psychic meaning to it. And, you know, there's a spider crawling up the wall. Oh, that means that we should live better as a human race. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, or, you know, uh, every crop circle is a, is a, is a message to humanity and, and all this no, it's not. It's a crop circle. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows what it is. And uh, But uh, those people will not have the discernment to uh, follow a pattern and to say, look, I was right here. I was wrong here. Put this into a database. Here's my track record. Here's my average being right in colors, wrong in colors correct in taste, incorrect in taste, and so on. And uh, it's very much a science. It depends very heavily on computer databasing. And um, they're just not going to get it. And so I really don't want to take their money. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an old, old school Texan. You know, you work for your money and, and you don't take money that you don't earn. Right. Has there been any people that have really scared you that you've come across? No, uh, not really, no. Uh, uh, you mean as a person or as a, uh, <laughs> as a viewer? 
<laughs> well, either one. I was sort of I, I was going to ask the other, so they're, they're both kind of applicable here. No, I really don't get scared of people. Uh, I have always been able to take care of myself on that level. Um, as far as the viewing, no. Uh, uh, I I find new things fascinating uh, rather than scary. Um, we've had some good people in here who really learned, and we've had some good natural psychics in here who are here just to learn the controls so they can control their ability. And um, several of them, I've just sat and watched them work, and, you know, after all these years, I keep thinking, man, on my best day, I could never do that well. <laughs> <laughs> but they have they have talent, and you give them the control over it, and oh, it's amazing to watch. Yeah. Now, now there was some reference to you and the uh, the men that uh, stare at goats movie. Yeah. Well. Um, people keep asking who George Clooney played in the movie, and of course. Uh, his name in the movie, his character's name was Lynn, L-Y-N, just like mine, which is a girl's spelling. And um, uh, many of the incidents that happened in that movie happened to me. Uh, the movie starts off by, you wouldn't believe how much of this is really true. Uh, however, he had... Uh, the writer had 18 years of incidents to put into a, you know, hour and a half movie, and uh, and so things that happened to different people uh, were put into each different character in the movie. Uh, General Hapgood was General Stubblebine, but was also a compilation of other events that happened to other people. Uh, so was Len Cassidy, George Clooney played. Um, but many of the events that happened to me were played by George Clooney. And uh, some of the incidents that happened to Mel Riley, Paul Smith, uh, Joe McMonagall, and, and so forth, were also mixed in so that it would fit the story. So he was a compilation Lynn Cassidy was a compilation of many characters. So, do you, did you did you enjoy the movie then, or? I thought it was great. <laughs> uh, they they filmed part of it out here, about ten miles from my home, and uh, never let me onto the set uh, because you know basically it was just a uh, it was just making fun of everything we did, but it was funny and it was well done and. Uh, Shoot, if they had let me onto the set, I could have told them a bunch of funnier stuff than that. So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it was a uh, it was a funny movie. Uh, the things that actually did happen, they portrayed truthfully, and of course, then they put it into the uh, into the background story, which is all made up. Uh, but they they showed things very truthfully. In fact, yeah. is there any big 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 things that you discovered by doing this that uh, you can talk about? Uh, well, yeah, uh, I discovered myself actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you you can't do this without dipping into your subconscious, and your subconscious knows you better than anybody else, and. Uh, and you better become friends with it. <laughs> uh, and in fact, you're exposed to it so much that you do become friends with yourself. Um, but uh, there were some military things that have been since declassified. Uh, a uh, uh, what was called a death ray over in uh, over in Russia. Uh, uh, the plans and intentions of foreign leaders. Uh, we did a lot of uh, 
uh, work on scientific developments in foreign countries, um, down to even, you know, sometimes drawing schematics and things. And so, yeah, there is a lot of stuff that has been declassified and, in fact, is uh, available now throughout the Internet, but also in, uh, you know, by applying to the Freedom of Information Act. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a good way of doing it. I'm finding most people, even journalists, aren't really spending much time researching anymore. Yeah, I know, and that's that's kind of sad. Uh, I was at 9-11, uh, lower Manhattan on 9-11, and was watching the uh, news. We were trapped there on the island, and uh, the different restaurants would have the... Uh, their television sitting outside so people in the street could watch and the news coverage was just terrible uh, they were reporting things that never happened and uh, yeah there there needs to be more professionalism and, and things like that yeah there's I just I, they, they make a lot of mistakes and they say a lot of things without researching and uh, yeah uh-huh. and uh, it's kind of too bad because that's kind of what you would rely on to get information. So, yeah, it is. Uh-huh. Yeah, and so uh, what do you think about the debunkers, the people that sort of don't buy into any of this? Like, uh, well, you know, they have their thing. They everybody needs a gimmick, I guess. Uh, the uh, debunker that they hired to close down the um, Stargate project, uh, which was the last name that I knew about uh, for the remote viewing unit. Uh, they hired a, um, a statistician and a debunker to evaluate the project. The statistician found out that it was uh, reliable. It was, uh, there was actually something going on that the information provided was uh, uh, fairly accurate, uh, even though all they looked at was our practice sessions because uh, they were not allowed to look at anything classified. So they looked at our practice sessions, and the statistician showed that everything was uh, was above board, was valuable for the intelligence effort and all that. The uh, debunker wound up by saying that they should at least postpone this, uh, any use of it, for intelligence purposes until the science of statistics could get its act together. <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah how, how dumb can you be? Yeah. Well, there's usually some sort of agenda behind stupid statements, oh, you know. Yeah. yeah. Usually. Oh. That's, so, well, let's, let's talk about, um, how about telling people how they can get a hold of you or what... Uh, uh, if they need to uh, communicate with you and stuff, do you have like a uh, site and place people can go? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, the website is crviewer, crviewer.com. And it is the first and oldest website about uh, controlled remote viewing. Uh, as soon as it became declassified, I started a website because I saw all this uh, uh, misinformation going out and also I started a website. So it's the first website that was formed on controlled remote viewing. And uh, we have questions and answers. We have uh, uh, all kinds of explanatory pages. We have analogies that show the uh, theory behind it. and. Uh, we also have around 400 now, around 400 practice targets that people can just, you know, bring them up and try them, see how they do. And um, there is no tracking of who does it. There's no, you know, there's no uh, cookies put on anybody's uh, computer. It's one of those things where if you do poorly, Nobody knows, and if you do well, hey, you have complete bragging rights to anybody you want. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it has a lot of uh, 
a lot of free information and a lot of uh, things for you to practice and try. It also has our contact information and uh, uh, I like to tell people that our uh, my email I get at least 100 to 150 email a day uh, there's no way I can keep up and uh, that uh, if they want to contact me first of all make the email very short um, and uh, and to the point and I will get to it as soon as I possibly can yeah, yeah I know the feeling <laughs> So uh, and also, I've been going through your Seventh Sense book, and yeah. I'm going to recommend people to get that. It's a very very good book, and uh, we're going to also post all of this on our website and on the Facebook, and people can uh, connect up with you. Good. All right. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. That's that's it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, is there is there more that you want to go into, or some area that I've missed? No, no, that's that's very good. I think you covered things very well, and uh, and I appreciate the questions that you asked, uh, rather than just tell me about the military history. Tell me about you know the same old questions. Uh, 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 you're a good interviewer. <laughs> I like that. Wow. Thank you. I appreciate the compliment. That's nice. Okay. Well, so what we do, um, I'll send you the ad as soon as the ad's created. Okay. And so you'll get that. And then the date that it'll run. And uh, then when we run it, what we do is we um, take all of the questions we get for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, we compile kind of the five most popular. And I'll send them to you. And okay. If, and, and if you and if you answer them, what we do is then we post them on Facebook as well as the website. All right. Good. So it's kind of a way of being a little bit interactive, you know. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. Well, thank you. I uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, okay. Perhaps we can do it again. Good. Sounds good. Okay. Well, you have yourself a good day. You too. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. I'll be back. You've been listening to the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.